This man, even though using a hammer and chisel, is working carefully to free several large leg bones from the rock-like material around them. He's being careful because these are not just any bones. They are the fossilized remains of a dinosaur that lived more than 200 million years ago. In the United States, this kind of work usually takes place in the western deserts, where many dinosaur fossils can be found. But this is Manhattan. They're removing bones from the concrete base of an exhibit at the American Museum of Natural History. In fact, workers are dismantling all the skeletons in the hall. And scientists who study fossils, called paleontologists, will soon put them back together in different ways. Why is the museum going to all this trouble? Is it just to set up old bones in newer, more fashionable displays? Hardly. These exhibits were first assembled at the turn of the century, soon after many of these fossils were discovered. The bones were put together according to the best information paleontologists had at the time. But since then, researchers have learned a great deal more about extinct plants and animals. The new information has led to surprising changes in the way we think about these ancient creatures. This fellow, called Apatosaurus, will have his skull removed so a different one can be mounted in its place. The skull mix-up goes back to 1879, when the first complete fossil of this dinosaur was found. Complete, that is, except for its skull. Searching for a likely skull to complete the specimen, paleontologists mistakenly chose the head of a different type of dinosaur. Only when new fossils were found did they realize their mistake. Now the head must be changed. New discoveries are always shaking up scientists' ideas, and they're always looking back at old theories to rethink them in the light of new information. No matter how much work scientists have done in the past, they always have more to do as our knowledge of the world expands. Major museums frequently update their exhibits to keep up with changing views. But where do these new ideas in science come from? Sometimes they're the result of fresh discoveries, but often they come from scientists who take a new look at old information. Niles Eldridge is one such scientist. His work has led to major changes in the way most researchers think about evolution. To understand why Eldridge's work is so important, we need to glance back at the history of evolutionary theory. Modern views of evolution date back to Charles Darwin. During his studies, he saw how animal breeders, such as those who worked with fancy pigeons, could produce a wide variety of different looking animals through selective breeding. After years of studying both fossils and living organisms, Darwin proposed that a similar process was responsible for the incredible diversity of plants and animals in the natural world like the hundreds of beetle species he discovered in South America. That process he called natural selection. According to Darwin, and most biologists since his time, today's plants and animals have all come about through a long, slow process. This illustration of horse evolution, for example, represents the traditional view that slow, steady change through time gradually transformed the ancient dawn horse into the creature we know today. Niles Eldridge decided to look for evidence of this gradual change in the fossil record, but he decided not to study fossils of large extinct animals, such as horses and dinosaurs, for two reasons. First, complete fossils of large extinct animals are rare, and second, those fossils are often found in jumbled bone piles, such as this one. As the Apatosaurus story tells us, it's often difficult to piece these jigsaw puzzles together properly. Eldridge decided to work with extinct relatives of crabs and shrimp, called trilobites. They lived in the ancient seas that once covered most of the central and southern United States. For each complete dinosaur unearthed, 
researchers can uncover thousands of these smaller fossils. This allows them to study populations in great detail. With so many complete fossils to study, it's more likely that researchers will be able to spot small changes. By comparing a great many fossils in this way, Eldridge hoped to uncover evidence of gradual evolutionary change over time. So I set out. I went out with my brother. I went out with my wife at various times and drove all over the Midwest. It was an education unto itself and uh, collected fossils wherever we could, using guidebooks and so forth, finding our own places. And uh, I started to realize that all the fossils I was collecting, whether it was in New York or in Iowa or wherever, uh, and whatever part of time I was, in the lowest, uh, earliest parts of time, or six million years later, up near the end of the history of the species, they all look the same to me. And at first, I put that down to inexperience. I thought, well, I'm not working actually under a, a, a trilobite expert. Uh, maybe I just uh, I'm not good enough to see the obvious changes uh, that are here. And I remember one day it was particularly horrible because I was back at the museum and I saw some specimens from Germany. Uh, and I couldn't tell them apart from, from my specimens from the American Midwest. So I said, oh, this is awful. And maybe if I can uh, me make lots of measurements and use the computer, we uh, did a lot of mathematical treatment of these things, uh, I'll, I'll find out some, some results. I'll get some positive results. I was desperate to get positive results because I was doing a PhD thesis. Uh, the whole object of a PhD thesis is to demonstrate that you know how to frame a scientific study and to carry it out successfully. And here I was a failure because uh, after collecting for one summer, coming back and looking at the fossils for a whole year and then going out in the summer again and finding no evidence of change whatsoever, I, I could only see that as a failure. Finally, Eldridge spotted an important clue. He discovered two different patterns in the eyes of his specimens. One pattern he found in some parts of the country, and the second pattern in other places. And in a cow pasture in upstate New York, he found specimens that bridged the gap. I got a pattern of change and a pattern of distribution. I could see that they were acting as though they were different species, closely related species, but they were different. And that there had been some change, finally, you know, in, the, in this eight million year period of time. Finally, there was something to talk about. And I realized, though, that the pattern did not conform to what I was initially looking for, which was what Darwin told us we ought to find, which was that as you go through time, you're going to get this progressive change very slowly accumulating through time. Evolutionary biologist Stephen Jay Gould explains why these data were so puzzling. The problem was that Evolution was defined by most paleontologists, at least in terms of what you might see in the fossil record, as finding a series of fossils arranged in a time sequence, that is up a hillside, for example, through a set of sediments, where you would get imperceptibly gradual change, little by little, that you'd find a brachiopod or a clam or some kind of animal in the oldest rocks, and then as you went to younger and younger rocks, they'd get a little bit bigger or a little bit ribbier, gradually and imperceptibly, tiny bit by a tiny bit in each younger rock. Paleontologists also knew that you never found that, or hardly ever found it. In fact, what you'd usually find in the fossil record is uh, one form that was pretty stable and it would have a range <clears throat> that often existed for millions of years and then you'd get another form that you could say was its descendant that had evolved from it and it would be different and it would be different immediately when you first found it and its difference from its ancestor wouldn't increase it would also be stable up the sequence of rocks the big signal here is that once a species appears, it tends to persist for millions of years without showing much change. Or maybe a little variation here and there, but not a great deal of change. There's a tremendous amount of stability. So I had grown up thinking that evolution, given eight million years and a complex anatomy, it'd be inevitable that you'd find change. And what I was finding out was there was almost no change at all. And what such change that there was was fairly trivial. Um, so that's tremendous stability. That was interesting. Not predicted either by Darwin, although he knew about the phenomenon, but he sort of brushed it aside. Uh, but certainly not uh, predicted by modern genetics, which is the core of, of modern uh, evolutionary theory. Working together, Eldridge and Gould called their new pattern punctuated equilibria. 
punctuated equilibria refers to this pattern that we have uh, of tremendous stability, of non-change of species once they first appear. They tend to go on with these invertebrates for 5 or 10, even 15 million years without showing much evolutionary change. That's the equilibrium part of it. And when you do get evolutionary change, it tends to be concentrated in these splitting events when one species will, will diverge off from another. And that will happen perhaps in five or 50,000 or even 100,000 years of time. It doesn't take a great deal of time for that divergence to happen. So that's the punctuation. The traditional picture of horse evolution helps us see how thinking about evolution has changed. The old view assumes that each ancient horse species evolved into a later one slowly and gradually forming this simple evolutionary tree. This more recent view shows that species are now thought to stay the same for longer periods of time. Also, when new species are produced, they tend to be produced by sudden branching, making more of a bush than a tree. Professor Gould explains why this is important. People say if humans evolved from apes, why are apes still around? As though that's a disproof of evolution. Now, that's a perfectly ridiculous statement because evolution is a branching process. Of course apes can still be around and humans evolved from some kind of ape because apes didn't turn all over the world into humans. One population of apes branched off from others, the others survived, and that branch eventually evolves into humans. As these researchers all know, science is always changing. It's important to understand that change doesn't make science wrong and that debate about how evolution works does not question the fact that evolution has occurred. After all, if scientists decide to debate the meaning of gravity, which happened when Einstein developed a theory different from Newton's, apples didn't stop falling while that debate was going on pending the outcome. The facts of the world keep going. The explanations are widely debated. Now, science is at its healthiest when it's engaged in good, fruitful, and exciting debates about theories, especially when those debates are based upon the common understanding and acceptance of the factual information. That's what's happened with evolution. All scientists are perfectly content with the factual character of evolution, and we're struggling to understand how it happens. So the apples fall, but we're arguing about why. But we are always trying to sharpen up our connection, our pictures that we're drawing, trying to uh, relate the history of life or our pictures or our images of what the patterns of the history of life were like with our notions of what causes these patterns, how life actually evolves. And naturally, uh, uh, we, we have learned more things and we have changed our perspective. We see that Darwin wasn't entirely right about everything, but that would be terrible because <laughs> that we would have nothing to do. Science is a constant learning process of new ideas and discoveries. Our knowledge of how the world works improves. We know that plants and animals evolved, and we have a number of ideas about how this happened. The theory of punctuated equilibria suggests that rather than changing gradually and slowly, species change rapidly after remaining stable for long periods of time. Our understanding of the past has deepened, even though new surprises will always await. <laughs>